Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Over the years, we've done a number of biographical shows on Karl Marx, but we've never really done one about the final years of the philosopher's life. In fact, there's not much even written about it, at least not until now. Our guest, Marcello Musto, has a book called, and he's going to join us to talk about it, called The Last Years of Karl Marx and Intellectual Biography. Marcello Musto is a professor of sociological theory at York University in Toronto, Canada, where he is also the founding director of the Laboratory for Alternative Theories. Marcello Musto, it's a great pleasure to welcome you back to this radio program. Thanks for inviting me once again. Thank you very much. Karl Marx was born in 1818 and died in 1883. Your book focuses on 1881 to 1883, the last two years of his life. Uh, he died at the age of 64, about to turn 65. Not old for today's standard, but of course, life expectancy was much shorter in his time. Before we get into the ideas that he laid out in a number of notebooks and letters and correspondence, correspondences that he had in the last couple of years of his life, talk to me about Karl Marx the man. Tell me about his health in these last couple of years. How is he financially? How is he socially? Well, um, financially, I will say that Marx was uh, in a much better position compared to the 1850s and 1860s. Those were decades uh, during which the, the Marx family suffered, uh, you know, poorness, basically. Uh, thanks to Engels, they were able to survive. They lived in... Uh, in Seoul, in London, after they, you know, basically were uh, kicked out uh, any European country, you know, from Germany, from France, from Belgium, and after the um, defeat of the 1848 revolution, they decided to go to London. Terrible time, and uh, they had also uh, poverty, they suffered poverty also in the 1860s. The situation improved significantly when Engels retired, moved from Manchester to London, and um, he could spend an even bigger portion of his uh, uh, money uh, helping Marx and his family. From the social point of view, well, Marx, well, is no longer poor, but still is very, very tired. Like, you know, his body is uh, feeling the, the battles of the previous decades, I would say. Socially, as you said, I would say that this Marx is um, extremely sad, because in this two years, two years and a half that I you know, discuss in my book, he first lost his wife and then his, uh, his daughter, his wife, Jenny from Westphalen. And the daughter was also called Jenny. They used to call her Jenny Shen, little Jenny. So these things came one after another. Um, and this was very, very uh, severe, very hard for, for Marx. Um, he is having a lot of health issues. This is perhaps the one of the most significant characteristics of these three years of his life, like, you know, in the 80s, 1881, 1882, 1883. Uh, Marx is having problems with, um, you know, uh, pneumonia, bronchitis, pleuritis, and uh, a significant part of this time in this last three years of his life is basically trying to move from one country to another in order to find uh, a better weather who will help him recover and return to Das Kapital. Yeah, uh, weather was a big deal and people were always tr trying to find different climates to see if it would improve their weather. Do, do you know what he died of? The cause of death? Yes. Yes, he died of these uh, problems related to to his, uh, um, um, you know, respiratory apparatus. Basically, he has been uh, in trouble for, for you know, two years, two years and a half. Marx already suffered these things earlier and actually he used to go several times at the um, uh, island of White in the south of England, uh, which is, you know, uh, a place that is visiting twice in this period. Then Marx is also visiting his daughters in France, but they used to live around Paris, and there is not very much difference between London and Paris at the time. Perhaps, you know, just a little bit less rain. So Marx is then moving to the south of France and is spending a significant time in the south of France, later also in Switzerland, trying to do particular cure that actually he had done already you know, at the middle of the 70s in, uh, you know, 
what we used to call the, 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 the former Czechoslovakia. But what is uh, striking for um, the readers of Marx, also for those who know his biography, is the fact that for the first time in his life, in this final period, um, he is going outside Europe for the first and only time. And he went to Algeria. He spent two months and a half in Algeria because this was a destination where, you know, some people, you know, with money and Engels provided this could go in months like February, March, right? Complicated months to stay. And March, Marx really tried everything, but in the end he was convinced to go to Algeria. Unfortunately, the weather that he found there was even worse, was the worst Algerian winter in decades. And Marx is making a lot of fun of this with his usual self-irony in the letters that he wrote to friends and family. Mar uh, Karl Marx today is kind of seen as, as, as a god within the sphere of philosophy. Uh, not that he would describe it that way, of course. Um, is he seen as a major philosopher here at the end of his life? When, when, when does sort of Marx start to take on this legendary status that he eventually get? That's a very, very interesting question. And actually, I've been devoting um, a significant portion of my study to the history of reception and dissemination of Marx. This helps us to, you know, get rid of many legends and, and myths about his, uh, about his life and about the impact. For example, Marx published the Manifesto of the Communist Party in 1848, just a few weeks before the revolution. Ideal, but nobody read this text, right? And um, I will say that Marx is very isolated in the 1850s. Like, you know, I could count the number of people he was in touch with when he went to London, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, um, it is in 1864 when the International Working Men Association was founded and Marx quickly became one of the most important members and leader of this association. The association lasted until 1872 because of the famous split with Bakunin and many other problems. Well, in this period, Marx is becoming well known, uh, I would say, in Europe. But it was in particular because of the Paris Commune in 1871. And for this very short but famous pamphlet, The Civil War in France, that Marx published in the year 1871, that he started to become well known. And the Communist Manifesto started to circulate and be translated exactly in this period. So it is for political reason that the theoretical uh, analysis of Marx, that is critique of political economy, is first of all circulated. Then, of course, there is the life of capital. Um, as, the, um, um, as we know, Capital was only published by Marx uh, in his uh, first volume. Volume two and three were published by Engels after Marx died. Um, Engels survived Marx of 12 years. He died in 1895. And when Capital was published in 1867, um, it started to circulate a little bit slowly. Then it was reprinted in Germany. And then he was um, very successful in a country that Marx had no idea that his ideas could circulate, Russia. Marx always had um, a very negative idea about Russia because he considered this country like, you know, um, the uh, expression of the counter-revolution. This is not a country where you expect the revolution to start, even though Marx change his opinion in the final years of his life. We might want to talk about this later. But the Russian translation of Capital was um, a very significant thing. It was read by all the Russian uh, aristocracy, of course, you know, the brilliant mind who were interested in this. And then there is the French revolution of the uh, tradition, translation, sorry, of Das Kapital. Actually, this year we celebrate the 150th anniversary. I'm publishing a um, edited volume on this, because this is a translation to which Marx participated himself. He was not satisfied of the job done by the translator, and he decided to do it by himself. Marx was fluent with eight language, not as good as Engels, who used to write in 12, but still he was okay, right? So Marx added many things and 
change updated, I would say, some parts of uh, Das Kapital in this new edition. So I would say that there is a political reception that is much stronger, and then there is also this critique of political economy that is starting to circulate from the early 70s. It is only in this period that Marx is become known, but still um, uh, many people did not listen to Marx. And, you know, the very famous example of this is when there is the fusion of the two social democratic parties in Germany. Was more One more revolutionary close to Marx, one more reformist state socialism close to La Salle. Well, Marx was you know, waiting to be contacted for the political program, etc. They ignored Marx, right? So it is still not this uh, um, uh, a statue that we see in the squares of Moscow or in Beijing in the 20th century. Hmm? An important point in your book, The Last Years of Karl Marx, an intellectual bi- biography, is in these final couple of years of his life, what his work really points to is that he never stops working on his ideas that he has developed over his lifetime, that he's continually revising them and thinking about them and, and refining them, I guess. That, that's my term. I'll, I'll let you describe it better than I will. But it's probably important as we dive into the final couple of years of Karl Marx's intellectual work, what the time preceding all of that uh, meant. So let's Perhaps give me a, a, a roundabout view of, of Karl Marx and his intellectual development over his lifespan. Yeah, I would say it's um, very um, interesting for us that an author that has been um, depicted as, a, I don't know, a dogmatic, deterministic by um, you know, the old anti-Marxist, anti-communist people. Actually, I start uh, the book with a quotation that I found uh, very interesting and says, perhaps one socialist in a thousand has ever read any of Marx's economic writings and a thousand of anti-Marxists, not even one has read Marx. And uh, Everyone has an there, opinion of Marx. No one's read them. And everybody wants to say something. Uh, <laughs> the interesting things and, uh, you know, why Marx is good as a scholar, as an example for, you know, a new generation of scholars, for example, I'm not talking about his political ideas here, is how self-critical he was and how um, we can see now that with the new um, edition of his writings in Germany, we also have access for the first time to the manuscripts in terms of notebooks the studies that Marx did, and the, a significant part of my book is based on this. Wait, when, did these ma- when, did, when did these manuscripts become available? Well, Marx actually wrote uh, 200 notebooks of excerpts. He didn't have the photocopy at the time, so he used to go to the library and used to write down the most important parts of the book that he was reading and very often, you know, make comments on this. This is extremely interesting for us. This bo- These notebooks were written by Marx between 1836, um, 38, like at the time when he was at the university as a university student, and the last ones are just a few months before he died. So this is useful for us because we can see how rigorous he was and also we can see the direction of his studies, where he wanted to go, particularly important for the last years of his life, the last decade of his life, when he didn't have enough energy to write and to publish book, books. But what I was trying to say before is that Instead of publishing, for example, volume two and volume three of Capital, Marx felt that he needed to study more. And it was for this reason that, for example, in 1869, when he was already 51 years old, he decided to study Russian. And Russia was um, a revolution in his life because basically from the middle of the 60s, Marx is now observing capitalism not only in Europe, but it's also very interesting to see what's going on in the United States after the end of civil war, what's 61, 65, what's going on in Russia after the end of serfdom in 1861. And as I might hopefully have the time to tell you later, is also expanding and looking at the global South a lot. There is a lot of global South in the last years of Karl Marx. So I usually say that he went 
outside Europe for the first time, you know, with his body, but also significantly, not for the first time, but very significantly with his mind, with his research. So I would say that Marx is no longer, not only, sorry, continuing his research, but is actually expanding his research. He's expanding his research to new topics, new disciplines, and this, of course, is, you know, very helpful for him because he could revise some of his ideas and the outcome was very um, useful for Marx. He could not finish what he wanted to do, but he's elaborating his ideas and he's developing some of his concepts in a new way. But he doesn't publish any books, as you mentioned, in the last couple of years of his life. No, he did not. He left many notes, he left many fragments. And, uh, you know, one of these is, for example, 1875, the critique of the Gotha program is a very well-known text, right? There's a text on which, uh, I don't know, Lenin and base base what to do, right? This was a letter that Marx wrote to the leaders of the uh, German Social Democratic Party in uh, in Germany, but uh, at the end of his life, he's writing. Uh, he wrote the famous letter to Vera Zasulic that has many drafts before. Or Marx has written the notebooks on anthropology, and this includes um, the very well-known comments that he made to uh, Morgan, the American anthropologist. And actually, some of these things were also taken later by Engels. Engels said, this is a testament. Some of the work that I'm doing is a sort of bequest to the last research of Marx. So we have an unfinished Marx, an incomplete Marx at the end of his life. But I would like to say that the questions that he asked to himself are as useful, or perhaps for us today in 2022, even more useful that, uh, I don't know, some... Uh, revolutionary writings in which Marx is writing, this is going to happen, or, you know, the proletariat should do this and that. It is very interesting how such a brilliant mind, um, always being self-critical and always trying to expand his research, is now trying to, you know, take new paths and trying to discuss new topics. So this is the last Marx. It's also about this. You referenced Vera Zasulic, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, who was in correspondence in 1881 with Karl Marx. Uh, she's important in understanding the story that, that you're telling me. Tell me about the importance of Vera Zasulich. Well, this correspondence between Marx and Vera Zasulich that basically was just one letter is uh, perhaps the most known things of the, of the last Marx, of the last years of Karl Marx. Uh, because Marx is receiving a letter so, as you mentioned before, he was known now. He was uh, an international leader. Mm, just to make an example so that uh, uh, listeners can understand, now the French Socialist Party is calling Marx to be helped to write the political program. No longer Proudhon, no longer French Socialists. So we can say that the hegemony of Marx is becoming significant. And it is for this reason that one day, he opened his mailbox and he found this letter from Vera Zasulic, who was a, a well-known revolutionary in his country, and you know, asked Marx what to do in um, a society where capitalism was not developed. And they knew that it was going to take a long, long time for this new mode of production to, you know, to be developed. So the question of Zasulic is very simple. In Russia, there was a rural commune. People used to work, you know, producing the agriculture with the commune that was called the Obshina. So she's asking Marx, should we use these ancient forms of communal property in order to bring, to build communism, to move forward? Or should we wait for the development of capitalism? And, you know, basically we can do politics only with, uh, you know, the workers, the proletarian of big factories. And many people believe that Marx was in favor of this last uh, idea. In Russia, there is a, a very significant movement that is called, you know, you know, Russian populism. The word has nothing to do with, you know, the adjective populism that we use today. So at the time, it really meant anti-capitalist left. And these people were 
uh, intellectuals who were trying to politicize people of the countryside, work with them in the Obshina. So many people and the first Marxist, this is one of the reasons why Marx famously said at the end of his life in this period, 81, 83, in a couple of uh, occasions, I am not a Marxist. The only thing that I know is that I'm not a Marxist because this Marxist who didn't read Marx, and in some times they could not do it, right? Because, you know, these texts were not uh, available. We can talk about this, but, you know, the corpus of Marx is very limited at the time. And we are talking about books that were complicated, expensive, publishing 3,000 copies in the entire country, right? In any case, they thought that revolution would be possible only in uh, capitalistically developed countries, right? So Russia was the last wheel of the couch, you know, the, the place where, you know, the revolution will start um, um, late. Uh, Marx was not uh, actually sharing these ideas. And the letter of Berat Zasulic that very interestingly is coming at the same time Marx was studying Morgan, his famous book, Ancient Society, uh, Anthropology. Well, these two um, requests, you know, one an intellectual solicitation and the other one really a political request, what to do in a pre-capitalist society, made Marx understand even more because actually Marx had already changed in 1871 after the Paris Commune, that the revolution can start in a place that is not, you know, the center of capitalism. And Marx was already disillusioned by the British uh, working class, who in the end decided to, you know, support or be part of this, you know, colonial society and, you know, basically receiving um, um, a little bit of benefit of uh, British imperialism. And this is also something that is happening later in Germany, right? When Germany is becoming an imperial power and uh, the working class is trying to negotiate you know, more political freedom, but then, um, you know, support to war during World War I. So Marx in this period is thinking that this form, this communal form of production can actually be useful. Of course, his socialism never changed. He's not Herzen, he's not Bakunin, he's not uh, uh, somebody who believed in, uh, I don't know, a superiority of Slavic race. There were many, you know, ideas like this at the time. Marx always believed that socialism needs capitalism in order to be developed. But we have to, he said, we have to, you know, use this communal form and sometimes even defend this communal form. The same example is made by Marx in Algeria, because actually French colonialism was doing the same, destroying this old form of communal property and bringing competition, private property and destruction of the community. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation about the last years of Karl Marx. Our guest is Marcello Musto, who is a professor of sociological theory at York University in Toronto, Canada, where he's also the founding director of the Laboratory for Alternative Theories. And he is the author of the book that we are in conversa conversation about called The Last Years of Karl Marx, an Intellectual Biography. So, so does Karl Marx end up disagreeing later on in life with what he wrote earlier on? I will not say that he disagreed, but I will say that um, he um, saw things in a, a less rigid way, and he was able to learn from history and from political experiences. Marx did not learn only as a scholar, you know, close in the London, in the British Museum Library. He learned a lot from, you know, the Paris Commune, Marx was not enthusiastic about, you know, the revolution in Paris in 1871 because he felt it was too early. But later when this happened, Marx perhaps understood as Lenin said later that uh, if you wait that all the perfect condition for the revolution are there, then the revolution will never arrive. And Marx believed that, you know, the Paris Commune in 1871 had demonstrated to the working class in the world that the revolution is possible and workers can take the government. The same in Russia, 
Marx is using a lot the work of a Russian sociologist called Chernyshevsky, and Marx was, you know, very fond of him and uh, he liked his, his work, and because you know Chernyshevsky basically explains. He's the one who wrote "What's to Be Done," correct? Among among other things, yeah, yes, that was influential to, to Lenin. Lenin was a book of fiction. Yes, in this period, actually, he wrote a book that is called Critique of the Philosophical Prejudice Against Communal Ownership of the Land, a book that he published in 1851, rich Marx uh, at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. And this was very important to Marx because basically Chernyshevsky's writing, when a social phenomenon has reached a high level of development in one nation, its progression to that stage in another more backward nation may occur rather more quickly than it did in the advanced nation. And there are many, many examples in his, in his work talking about New Zealand and other countries like this. So this is the change for Marx, the final change, the final proof in history that, you know, we don't have to follow the very famous sentence that Marx wrote in 1859 in the preface to the critique of political economy, that there is a, a, a sort of rigid progression of mode of production, uh, slavery, Asiatic mode of production, feudalism, capitalism, and socialism, right? It is possible that actually in some societies, you know, socialism is arriving before, that capitalism should not be um, such a terrible experience and uh, last for so long, like it happened in England or in other European countries. And this is why, let's move, if I may, to another topic of interest in this period. Um, not a new topic, I'm talking about India, because Marx wrote many, many articles of India as a journalist, as a correspondent of the most uh, well-known American newspaper in the 1850s, the New York uh, Tribune. And um, Marx uh, uh, is now looking at India and is not seeing any kind of progress, any kind of economic progress, any kind of social progress after decades of uh, British colonialism. So Marx is very, very uh, strong, even stronger than when he was... Uh, a young journalist of uh, 35 years old in the famous articles that he wrote in 1853, Marx said, you know, capitalism has brought to India only disaster and desperation, and we don't want this. We don't want it. So Marx is not a thinker that wants to see capitalism developing everywhere and history be the same, following the same course and revolution appearing everywhere in the world, following, you know, the same moments and with the same characteristic. It was actually for this reason that Marx had already written before, I do not want to write recipes for the cooking of the future, right? My task is to understand the general law of capitalism, trying to understand capitalism on a global scale. And Marx is doing this at the end of his life, more and more, even more than before. But uh, I'm not saying what socialism should be and how it should be built. There is not one solution. It would be different in different countries in different times. Did, did he hold that the Communist Manifesto was the way to achieve uh, a society that he would promote all of his life? No, and actually Marx said that the Communist Manifesto, who wrote with Friedrich Engels, both of them considered the Communist Manifesto an historic document, an historical document, a text that was written in 1848, by the way, when they were very, very young. There were 30 Marx and 28 Engels. And some people read the Communist Manifesto today like this is the final political program of Marx. Not true. They believe that this was an historical document. And actually, when Marx is writing this program for the French Socialist Party in 1880, I discussed this in my book because it is so important how Marx is now looking at 
new phenomenon that you could not see in the Germany, in the backward Germany of 1848. Marx is talking about the fact that women and men should have the same salary. Marx is talking about the fact that migrants should have exactly the same salary. They should be treated in the same way. There is no emancipation if these key issues are not at the center of the socialist program, of the program of the Communist Party. And this is actually so fun because today in North American University, there are this silly representation of Marx, like an author who was only able to talk about capital and labor. This is absolutely false, right? And Marx is not uh, Eurocentric. And, you know, the last years of his life demonstrate this very clearly. So Marx is developing his ideas. Marx is not dogmatic. And uh, the more he was studying, but he was studying like also, I don't know, uh, chemistry, geology, agriculture, because he wanted to be very strong when he was talking about, I don't know, uh, land reform or this kind of things for Capital Volume 3. And of course, this uh, research, you know, uh, improved his, uh, his thinking and made him see um, I don't know, things that he had not uh, developed in full before. Let's talk about India, for example. You know, Marx made uh, a very significant, you know, historical research in the 50s, at the middle of the 50s, and in the 70s, toward the end of the 70s. But now he's reading more sources, different sources, and he's actually making fun of all these racist anthropologists of the time, or I don't know, all these ambassadors who were traveling in the global south and were, you know, representing this part of the world in, 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 in a racist way. Marx is, uh, is very clear with this. So um, this is useful for him and he never stopped reading. He never stopped um, making research. And actually I would like to say this, that perhaps the last work that he did, like he died doing this, is a, a chronology, not only of economic events, but also of political events, uh, of all the main things that happened from, I don't know, three centuries before Jesus Christ to uh, up to 1648, you know, the, the famous uh, uh, war of, you know, 30 years. Marx is not only talking about Europe, but he's also talking about Middle East, uh, Mesopotamia, so I will say that he's trying to perhaps um, give a new historical foundation to, to, to communism or try to see, that's why he's also studying anthropology so much, trying to see what was there before capitalism. And this as a, a double uh, goal. The first one is epistemological to better understand the developments of the modes of production. And the second one is political. Marx wants to demonstrate to the working class that capitalism is not an eternal mode of production, but is historical. It was not there a few centuries ago, and it will not be there in the future if we will be able with class struggle and with class consciousness to build a new society, a new mode of production. Of course, it is in the 19th century, the span of Karl Marx's life, where we have the scientific revolution steaming forward. Um, couple questions there. One, did Karl Marx see himself as a scientist? And then another question, we can take these one at a time or however you wish, but you mentioned racism. It is in this period of time where we have the rise of also scientific racism. It is in these later notebooks where Karl Marx starts to turn his attention towards racism. So, oh, um, uh, actually, they are two very long. Uh, yeah, 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 I realized that after I did it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, technology, Marx is paying a lot of attention to technology. And actually, I will say that um, in this long uh, final period of his life, starting from the end of the 60s, uh, Marx is also writing a lot about ecology. We cannot go into this. This may be an occasion of another debate, but Marx is becoming more and more aware that capitalism is not only destroying human beings and social life, but also the earth. So Marx is studying 
uh, um, uh, you know, uh, technology and is reading these things and is realizing that this is a significant uh, part of the critique to, to capitalism. So perhaps this is the most interesting among the many things that we can say. But of course, he considered himself a scientist. And that's why he and Engels, because you know, Engels was also incredible as a scholar, they wanted to be updated about anything they could, including mathematics. At the end of his life, I tell the story here in the last years of Karl Marx in my book, Marx is also trying to develop a new theory of, of mathematics. So very interesting. The second things of racism, yes, Marx is talking about this in um, surprising ways. Uh, you know, I just have one minute for this. I must be very superficial. Not only, for example, is attacking um, the M MPs, the, the, you know, the most leftist member of parliament in, in England, because he's not condemning completely, entirely, uh, you know, the war, the occupation, the war of England in Egypt that is happening in this uh, period, shortly after Marx is going to Algiers, actually. But Marx is also reading all these um, newspapers that he was collecting from every corner of the world, particularly from the new United States and Russia. He used to ask his old comrades from the First International to send him statistics, statistics, and he was devouring the statistics. And both Jenny von Westphalen, and Marx's wife, in Angus, they were extremely worried about this, right? Because the more you will read, the more they saw the end of the work, uh, you know, being postponed. In any case, Marx is reading a lot about uh, uh, forms of uh, racism and discrimination of uh, Chinese workers in California, around San Francisco. Mm. This is a very important moment, you know, uh, end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s for this. There were riots and uh, um, actually uh, a colleague of mine wrote a, a wonderful new paper about this in another book that I edited, Rethinking Alternative with Marx last year. And the very good news that I want to give to the you know, American uh, readers of Marx that very soon all these notes of the last Marx not entirely, because we are talking about many, many notebooks, but the most significant one, they will be translated and published in a wonderful edition by Yale University Press. So there will be a rediscovery of this uh, late Marx. I'm convinced, uh, if I may add uh, something, just one minute, you know, Marx was completely forgotten, uh, a sort of oblivion for more than two decades, right? Perhaps from the middle of the 80s and even more after the fall of Berlin Wall in 1989. But after 2008, as we know, as we remember, Marx is once again back and uh, even the conservative and liberal newspapers are you know, publishing his old uh, articles about the economic crisis of 1857 or his interpretation critique of capitalism. I would say that on the contrary, there is a lot of the political Marx that must be rediscovered. That is not against the critique of political economy. I'm not in favor of this division, the philosophical Marx, the economic Marx, et cetera. But there is a lot that is coming in the coming years. And I believe there is room for a new generation of scholars, for a new generation of readers to discover uh, an author who is very much into this, you know, critique of ethnicity, critique of racism, understanding capitalism, you know, in a global sphere as a social dimension. Marx has done a lot about this. And usually, you know, there is the caricature that Marx is only thinking about, you know, the white male proletariats of, you know, British factories. That is absolutely not true. And are you saying you find this in his notebooks, specifically towards the end of his life? Yes, because uh, towards the end of his life, he's studying once again India. He's giving a lot of attention to Indonesia. He's looking that uh, French colonialism is destroying Algeria, so he's writing against this. And then all the political events... 
let's go back to this because you asked me an important thing. Yes, it's true. Marx is not writing books, but Marx is writing letters and letters were important at the time were important because, you know, you were in touch with people and this was useful to make them understand, to create, you know, a dynamic of, uh, um, I don't know, building political programs, alliances. And there are many references in these letters also about this. I just mentioned, you know, the criticism to British colonialism in Egypt. I took it from there, from from letter that Marx wrote to, to his daughters. You piqued my interest when you mentioned about the attention he gave to the Chinese in in the Western United States, California specifically. I mean, I knew about Karl Marx writing about the U.S. Civil War and and U.S. slavery. I I did not know about uh, him paying attention to the plight of Chinese workers in California. What, what, What did he say? Yes, uh, of course, we are not talking about, you know, um, very big notes, right? Um, And uh, it is very difficult to um, uh, understand that Marx did not have the time to write about this. Like, it's not that Marx is a person who is losing attention because he has his cell phone and every news that arrives is jumping there. Marx wanted to finish this, this work. He wanted to finish Capital, right? But this um, relevant, uh, remarkable political events are useful for Marx in order to understand where capitalism is going and what are the, you know, danger that the labor movement should understand. So there was a riot, you know, the San Francisco riot in uh, July 1877. And in November 1880, Marx wrote to Sorge. Sorge was the last general secretary of the first international because the international moved to the United States between 72 and 76, right? So he's asking for articles and uh, he's reading about all these uh, leaders of the labor movement who were using the slogan, the Chinaman must go. Marx is uh, talking about uh, um, uh, Kearney agitation in California, for example, right? So Marx said, Kearney had speculated that the workers rage at continuing crisis could be turned against migrant and used to stir up uh, clashes among the poor. So Marx is basically looking at this event and saying this is another form of racism, like the one that we have seen before in England against Irish people, like the one that we have seen in the United States against Afro-American. And Marx is saying there will be no emancipation, clearly, just like this, if the labor movement is not focused and understanding that these are key issues and that the solidarity among workers must be uh, the essential discourse of our political organizations. Unfortunately, this is not what happened with um, the Second International, with World War I, but there is a significant page of internationalism of the 20th century. And I believe that this is one of the most uh, remarkable um, and beautiful heritage that the labor movement has to offer to us today uh, at the end of the 19th century and then the 20th century. And these are key issues and these are things that we have to face in our contemporary political debates. So once again, returning to this Marx that is very political is useful because not only continue to research, but also expanded the research and these topics and these countries that he was reading and taking notes at the time are relevant for us today, right? In this world, ecology, like uh, the critique to capitalism with an ecological accent or, you know, understanding that uh, racism cannot be part of, of labor movement. And, you know, that's why the last years of Karl Marx um, are a significant period of his life that should no longer be seen like before. There were no intellectual biographies on this period. Why? Because scholars in the past, I'm talking about scholars until 1960s, 1970s, 
the generation after should not be justified like for this. But, you know, they look at Marx's uh, writings and they could not see works published. So they had the idea, okay, Marx was too tired. Marx was, you know, in very bad health condition. He could not work. And, you know, perhaps he understood that he had already given his contribution. Now, starting from the 70s with the publication of the anthropological, ethnological notebooks, and more recently with this new research, with the Marx revival, because, you know, in the last 15 years, not only we have these new publications of Marx, but we have a new generation that is reading Marx again, that is interested to discover Marx. After all, I was born in 1976, and I already see that there is a new generation of young people in their 20s that they want to understand, and their reading of Marx, their opinion of Marx is very, very different from this uh, dogmatic uh, Marxist, uh, Leninist ideology, the textbooks made in Moscow, you know, in the past. So I believe that there is a lot to do here, and uh, um, this Marx is very exciting. It's very interesting. I, I heard you say in a, another talk that without Marx, we wouldn't even say the word capitalism because we would just see our economic system now as sort of the natural affair of how things work. Yes, unfortunately, um, we will end the conversation with, uh, with a sad note. Then, unfortunately, today, in our society, it seems that we are closer to Marx, uh, I don't know, in 1840s, when he was young, than when Marx was old or in the 20th century. Because, as it has been said many times, we are now considering the end of the world, but we do not consider the end of capitalism. Marx, on the contrary, is always, from when he was very, very young to the last days of his life, trying to, you know, work on this idea that capitalism, as I said before, is historical, and that actually we can build another kind of society, we can build another mode of production. This is not an impossible mission. Uh, the only problem is that... Um, Capitalism today, I would say, is more developed than, than at Marx's time. Not only globally, we have been talking about, you know, all these countries, India, Indonesia, China, Asia, South America. Uh, but I would say in every sphere of our life, in every moment of, uh, of our life, um, not only when we enter the factory, not only like uh, Charlie Chaplin uh, depicted so well in modern times, but... This is also a reason why the struggle against capitalism is even more necessary and urgent than before at Marx's time. I'd like to ask this question, and it's a sincere question, not, not a challenging question, um, about capitalism. And clearly there are many things, including environmental degradation, that need to be dealt with that are an extreme problem climate change, global warming. And obviously with capitalism, you get great exploitation as well. But but one might also argue under capitalism, you know, slavery is as old as civilization. It's under a time of capitalism that slavery is abolished. It's under a time of capitalism when women gain more rights than they had before. It's under a time of capitalism when many people actually achieve rights that they had not done before. Is that is that an inaccurate thing to say or, or a misguided thing to say? What, what, how would you respond to that? It is actually so uh, uh, correct that it seems that this is coming from the Communist Manifesto of Marx and Engels, right? Because he made the, uh, you know, they, they wrote something about this in comparison with what happened before. Sometimes I make jokes with my students. I take some sentences and I say, who wrote this, a liberal or Marx? And they say the liberal, but actually it's a quotation from the Communist Manifesto. Correct. But uh, only in comparison to the past. And actually also the capitalism that we have today, the level of this equality that we have in our society that is, uh, you know, unprecedented if we look back at the past uh, decades. So this is really something alarming even if we only want to consider this and not open, you know, the ecological discussion. But at the same time, I must say, you know, and I want to criticize 
the experience or, you know, a significant part of the anti-capitalist experiences of the 20th century, we cannot have an alternative mode of production to capitalism that does not have freedom, liberty of human beings at, you know, the center of this project. And this is actually another topic uh, that, uh, you know, received the support of Marx. Marx has written about this, perhaps not very much at the end of his life. But if we go back to the economic manuscript, if we go back, for example, to the Grundrisse, the first draft of Capital in the 50s, and in many other places, Marx is always talking about a socialism in which there is freedom, there are liberties, they're actually um, bigger, right? Uh, deeper than in capitalism, not less. Of course, we are talking about a social conception of freedom, not only freedom for capital to circulate or for a small part of humanity to have uh, private property. And this is a problem that we have in our society, right? Uh, socialism was defeated. Capitalism is... Um, uh, extremely strong, perhaps stronger than, than ever, because we cannot even figure out an alternative or, as you said before, name an alternative, but this economic uh, system, this mode of production is uh, uh, unconceivable. It cannot last like this. And uh, we need to return Marx because he has a lot to say and he can help us a lot in order to build an alternative. Marcello Musto is a professor of sociological theory at York University in Toronto, Canada, where he's also the founding director of the Laboratory for Alternative Theories. He has joined us for a conversation about his book, The Last Years of Karl Marx, an Intellectual Biography. Marcello Musto, I enjoyed that very much, and I thank you. Thank you very much.